Hi everyone, thank you for joining this uh, conversation on the rise of settler violence in the West Bank. Um, we might have some uh, technical issue to to uh, uh, to solve just before we start, but I think we can uh, we can start uh, right now actually, and we'll uh, we'll solve that as we go. So last week, Crisis Group released a report uh, titled "Stemming Israeli Settler Violence at Its Root." that described the spike of incidents involving settlers since October 7 and the growing power they sway in Israeli politics. Uh, we're going to delve into more details with our speakers, uh, starting with uh, Merav Zanshine, uh, senior Israel analyst for uh, Crisis Group, uh, Issa Amro, who is, the, who is the director of Friends of Hebron, uh, Delaney Simon, a senior analyst for the U.S. program at Crisis Group, and Michael Hanna, who is the director of the U.S. program also uh, at Crisis Group. Uh, so we'll open this discussion to questions in the last uh, 30 minutes or so. If you want to ask a question, please send us a direct message at Crisis Group on the account of Crisis, on the Crisis Group account with your name and your question, and we'll ask this question to the uh, to, to the speakers. Uh, Merav, I'll start with you as the main author of this report. Uh, since uh, October 7, 674 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank, 11 of them killed by settlers. Uh, the number of incidents involving, involving settlers uh, as, as spike has been on the rise. Uh, settlements are not new. They have been growing for the last 30 years under all Israeli governments, and there are now uh, half a million Israeli settlers in the West Bank. But what has changed since October 7? Thanks, Karim, and thanks to those who joined. Um, I mean, as you said, None of what we're seeing is new, but since October 7th, settler violence has certainly become uh, much more extreme. Um, and there's several reasons for that. I mean, first of all, when you think about what settler violence looks like, uh, it's, you know, a bunch of Israelis who live in occupied territory who go and do different acts that intimidate, harass, assault, and in some cases kill, and increasingly uh, shooting with a uh, live a gunfire, killing Palestinians. Um, and sometimes th that those acts are done as revenge or as ways to kind of, in the same way that the army will show its presence, kind of show who the master is in the territory. In many cases, it comes as an act of revenge, even if it has other underlying strategies. And so when you think about what happened on October 7th, when Israel was attacked on its southern border with Gaza and 1,200 people were killed, uh, and you have a government in place already that has settler ministers in it, you have a situation in which settlers are feeling emboldened and they're feeling angry and they are scared and they are also feeling very empowered. And so after October 7th, the phenomenon of settler violence uh, increased dramatically. Uh, also because a lot of the attention in the media, in the Israeli government, in the military was focused elsewhere on Gaza. Um, and what you have is, uh, you know, what they call a wild West Bank, a wild, wild West Bank, where as it is already, you have a phenomenon and trends in which soldiers are standing idly by, and even more so after October 7th. And one of the main phenomenons that we saw um, were that a lot of the settlers, the Israeli civilians who live in the West Bank, uh, who are by virtue of the fact that they live in the West Bank, are eligible to carry arms to protect their communities. Some of those same people were then recruited into reserve duty as part of the emergency recruitment uh, after October 7th in the war to then be uh, authorized as uh, working with the army as reservists to protect those communities. So effectively, some of these settlers now, you know, most settlers are not violent uh, in that way, in the way of physically assaulting or intimidating or kicking out Palestinians. But the ones that are were also empowered by the army to protect their communities. And in many cases, uh, the way that they understand protection is intimidation and violence. And so those are some of the main factors that we've seen since October 7th. Uh, and we're going to come back, Merav, to this uh, to this interaction between uh, settler security forces and, and, and Israeli politicians and Israeli officials. But uh, Issa, uh, you have been documenting settler activity and st settler violence in the West Bank long before October 7. Uh, and I really encourage people to go to your Twitter account to see some of the, the incidents that you documented yourself. And that you sometimes were a victim of those uh, those incidents. W what is the I mean, same question as Merav, but what is the situation since October 7 for Palestinians in the West Bank? What has changed.
Isa, I'm not sure if you can hear us. Yes, Do you hear yes, me now? I can hear you. Yes. Can you repeat the question? So I was asking the same question as Merav. What has changed for Palestinians in the West Bank since October 7? Uh, a lot changed in the, in the West Bank since October 7. The settlers became the masters and the decision makers of uh, everything in the West Bank. The central joint, the Israeli military. So when you say that the settlers killed uh, 15 Palestinians since October 7th, they killed Palestinians when they were in civilian uniforms. But they killed many, many other Palestinians when they were in military uniform. In October 7th, me personally, I was kidnapped, detained and tortured by settlers in an army uniform. My house was attacked many times. Uh, by settlers in an army uniform many many times so that what 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 is changed that the israeli settlers went to their clothes and uh, took out their military uniform even without being reservists without being in the army and they wore their the, the military uniform and they started attacking palestinians the the quantity and the the the, the type of settler violence increased three, four times, uh, and uh, uh, the settlers are uh, completely, you know, wild uh, since October 7th. They organize attacks toward Palestinian uh, villages, Palestinian towns. They block the streets. Yesterday in Hebron, they blocked the streets and they attacked Palestinian uh, cars, the Palestinian vehicles, Palestinian uh, people. They attack Palestinian houses, they steal the sheep, they steal the goats, they steal the camels, they, they steal anything. So a lot changed uh, uh, since October 7th uh, of uh, uh, settler violence. Uh, and uh, settlers are the ones who are telling the army what to do in the West Bank. For example, Itamar Bingvir now is asking the Israeli military to close the roads, to close the streets, to close... Uh, you know, cities, uh, 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 you know, he's killing the army. In Hebrew, for example, the main closure is, is happening because the settlers, they want the closure. So they force the army to restrict our movement, restrict our life, uh, to arrest Palestinians, and they encourage the settlers to follow, to follow, to follow them. So this is what's, what's going on in, in the West Bank since October 7th. Uh, in H2, in Hebron, it's, it's more, much more violent. Uh, South Mount Hebron, much, much more violent. Uh, many Palestinian uh, towns and uh, uh, compounds, the families left because of uh, settler violence. So Palestinians were evicted physically by settlers in South Mount Hebron, in Jordan Valley, uh, around Nablus, uh, around uh, Ramallah. These areas now, it's under a severe... Uh, settler uh, attacks. Uh, what something else uh, I, I want to mention? The Palestinians are terrified. I see families, I see kids, the Palestinian women. They are very afraid of settlers. They are very afraid of what's going. It's going to be uh, something else uh, from uh, October seventh. We are talking about uh, one hundred forty thousand new rifles were given out from Itabar Bingvir to his followers. So you are talking that settlers who were not allowed to carry guns for their uh, criminal uh, record, they are allowed to carry guns. So many settlers in Hebron, they never, they, they never carried uh, a weapon because of their criminal record and because they are uh, extremists. Now they have weapons and they, are, they, they were, you know, the, the, the restrictions on giving out weapons to settlers when, uh, when Itamar Bingvir took it away. Uh, th thank you, Isan. We're going to come back to the situation on the ground. And, and just a reminder for our listeners that you can ask a question by sending a, a direct message to the Crisis Group account with your question and your name. Uh, and before we go back to the situation on the ground, I, I, I'd like to have the view from outside of Israel-Palestine. Uh, Delaney Simon, uh, uh, you, you are the, the, the U.S. Uh, senior analyst for, for Crisis Group. Uh, for the first time uh, this year, the U.S. has sanctioned uh, Israeli settlers, taken sanctions against 
uh, individuals. Uh, how significant is that, uh, that, that step? Thanks, Kareem. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Great, thanks, and um, and and thanks for including me here. It really is an excellent report that Mayrav has written, and I encourage all of the listeners to read it. Um, look, this is an unprecedented move by the United States. It's the first punitive step that the U.S. has ever taken vis-a-vis -vis the settlement enterprise. I mean, the, the closest that the U.S. has ever come was when Obama abstained from U.N. Security Council vote in 2016, condemning the settlements. Um, but that said, so far, it's more or less the only tangible thing that the Biden administration has done um, so far. And I believe that unless the Biden administration presses Israel in other ways to change its policies in the West Bank, the impact of the sanctions is going to be limited. Um, for the individual sanctioned, uh, sanctioned um, individuals and groups, they're barred from traveling to the U.S. They're barred from transacting with people and businesses in the U.S. If they have assets in the U.S., they can't access them. Um, those are those are sort of more individual effects. But overall, I think the the real um, implication is is a signaling um, is a signaling significance. Um, the U.S. is bestowing on Israel with these sanctions, a status that it usually reserves for pariahs like Iran, North Korea, drug kin kingpins. And in that way, it's um, it's it's significant. Um, whether the significance will change the situation on the ground, I think, has yet to be seen. Um, we're seeing new rounds of sanctions. We're seeing the EU, Canada and the UK also issuing sanctions. But um, as of yet, and as you just heard from Issa, if anything, the situation on the ground has just gotten gotten worse. Um, and so time will tell whether the sanctions will make a difference. I believe that their impact will always be limited as long as the Biden administration is reluctant to issue other measures uh, to tackle the, the settlement issue. Uh, and to speak about okay. that, uh, Michael, the, the the response from the Biden administration to, I mean, to Gaza, but also to what's happening in the, in the West Bank, how could you describe it? <laughs> Thanks, Kareem. Um, I think it's interesting to, to step, step back and, and perhaps look at the, the bigger picture. Prior to October 7th, um, the U.S. was focused elsewhere. Strategic competition with China, Russia's all-out um, invasion of Ukraine, uh, and, and the administration, and, and we saw this in, in an article written by uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, um, saw actually an emerging stability in um, in the Middle East. Um, and of course, there was no engagement on Israel-Palestine issues, little attention to the to the settlements um, beyond sort of boilerplate um, boilerplate language. And of course, October 7th shattered that analysis uh, that you could pursue normalization, you could re reduce re resources to the region and, and simply ignore the question of Palestine effectively. Um, and the administration obviously has been consumed by the war in Gaza. Uh, and this, in the beginning, obviously overshadowed, I think, what was happening in, in the West Bank. Uh, but since that time, I think it's also drawn increased attention and scrutiny to what is happening uh, in, in the West Bank. Um, and and that's spurred some, I think, as, as Delaney mentioned, some limited uh, U.S. response. And, and I think it's important to note that that response would not have happened, uh, but for the events, um, uh, but for the events in, in Gaza, uh, and that has been, I think, an insufficient effort, but an effort to uh, attempt to balance policy and and a realization that there are domestic political consequences to how the administration goes about dealing uh, with this issue, um, and so I think. Uh, uh, the, the ferocity and totality of the war, the inability to uh, to make progress on a ceasefire, um, I think pushed the administration to take some steps that I think um, would have been uh, uh, inconceivable prior, um, despite the fact that they're they're sort of insufficient to deal with the challenge. Um, we also saw the administration um, uh, signal a return to longstanding U.S. policy on settlements, the, in reversing what the Trump administration had done. Uh, prior, um, sort of, so Blinken in February uh, basically reinstated the U.S. policy 
that uh, settlements were uh, inconsistent uh, with international law, uh, reversing the 2019 Pompeo uh, 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 statements. Um, and so um, you've seen these small, small steps, I think important steps, uh, but steps nonetheless that are, uh, uh, as Delaney sort of mentioned, um, difficult to imagine succeeding on their own. Um, they're important symbolically. They reflect a, a shift. I think they wouldn't have happened but for the war in Gaza. Uh, where they go, I think, depends on uh, what a future administration uh, uh, does much more broadly. Uh, in and of themselves, uh, they, they are important but, but contain steps. Uh, Isa, for, for, for you in the West Bank, how do you view these sanctions taken by the U.S. against uh, some Israeli settlers, I mean, a handful of them? First, I want to comment about uh, Biden's administration. Uh, Biden administration removed the Kahanists. The Kahanists uh, are the followers of Meir Kahana, Kah movement which was considered as a terrorist organization, it was removed from the State Department terrorist list 2022. Bring them back to the terrorist list, because many of them are now the followers of Utsmaya uh, Hudit, the followers of uh, Itamar Bingvir, and Itamar Bingvir is one of one of the main Kahanists and uh, Baruch Marzel and other fanatic uh, Israeli leaders. I don't think it's... Uh, it's it's going to affect the the situation, and it's not proportional to the settler violence. Uh, I and I think if they want really to to uh, reduce uh, settler violence and make settlers uh, accountable, settlers don't do violence without the Israeli military backup and escort. Uh, Israeli settlers don't do violence without a backup from Israeli. Some Israeli ministers, some Israeli Knesset members, uh, some Israeli organizations. The main organization which is really now making the life of the Palestinians harder and harder, Rakavim. Rakavim was co-founded by Smotrich. And this organization, their main, main mandate is to remove the Palestinians from Area C. Their main mandate. And they are very active in the Congress and they are very active... In, in the state to collect funding and to get uh, political uh, support. So this kind of uh, measures from Biden's administration is not proportional to the, to the situation in the ground, and it's not practical. Sanctions must be to the, their donors. For example, the settlers in Hebron, they get their money from uh, American charity called Hebron Fund. They get all their money almost from Hebron Fund, so if they really want to target uh, Israeli settlements, especially after the ACJ uh, ruled that uh, occupation is illegal and anything inside the occupation is illegal, so it's a war crime now. Uh, and settlement is a war crime according to Geneva Convention Article 49. We want a real concrete actions to make settlements and occupation costly to the Israeli settlers and to their leaders. It's something very, very important. And Merav, I'm, going, I'm coming back to you because what I found very interesting in your report is, is how you describe the, 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 the rising, the growing influence of, of extremist settlers at all levels of Israeli society and, and, and Israeli government. I mean, is it still accurate to, to dismiss the, 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 the incident by violent settlers as the action of a few bad apples, as uh, is often stated by Israeli officials? Um, I mean, to echo what Issa said, you know, none of this could happen if the Israeli government, the army, the courts, the police didn't allow it to happen. Um, and there's, you know, there's a phenomenon of the last 20 years in which settlers um, as a movement, as a political group and a movement have worked very hard and very uh, effectively to move into those institutions. So. In terms of numbers, there's still a minority, let's say. And in terms of the people who are actually uh, committing the most egregious acts of violence, they're still in the minority. 
But the movement itself, and we have to also remember that set, the settlement itself to, to move Israeli civilians into occupied territory and then to put soldiers around them to protect them and to dispossess Palestinians of their land and their resources and their livelihoods is in itself a violent act. And that is an act done by the state. Now, what, what certain settlers have done since then is to take those um, you know, actions and, and take them further and say, okay, well, Israel has to, you know, Israel as a state has certain limitations. It has the public legitimacy. It has international law to think about. And again, not that, you know, Israel has acted with impunity for, for a long time, but it still has had to take that into account. And there have been some governments, like primarily the Rabin government, who have tried to put some breaks on the settlement enterprise. Uh, but all in all, you know, they haven't. And the settlers have worked uh, very, very hard to both from outside the establishment and now inside the establishment to work to, to continue that. So in that sense, it's very much a state project. It's a state uh, policy. Um, and if you look at the conviction rates, for example, of settlers, so, you know, if we think about the sanctions, like they have potential, but when you really, like Isa said, when you really want to get to the heart of the matter, you have to get to them where it hurts. And one of those places is in actually holding settlers accountable for, for their actions, for their crimes. Um, and that's not done even, you know, to the small few. Um, and there's a, it's a very kind of, you know, complex dynamic between how IDF understands its responsibility versus how the police understands its responsibility. But ultimately, the army um, is not the, inst it's not the entity that is supposed to be arresting uh, Israeli civilians in the West Bank. That's the role of the police. So that the in the best case scenario, what the IDF can do is to detain an Israeli, um, which they normally don't do at all. But if they were to do that, then they would have to hand it over to the police and the police would have to go through proceedings and uh, indictments and convictions. And the rates of conviction are almost nothing when it comes to settler violence. So settlers have understood from that that they can act with impunity. And so you have a whole system that that's behind it. Um, so it's, it's not just about the numbers, although if we're talking about the change since October 7th, the numbers have grown. And if we also look at the number of settlers in the government and settlers that are represented in the media and in the courts and in all the various state institutions, it has grown uh, quite significantly over the last decade. And, and th those settlers or violent settlers, I mean, who are they and how do they compare to the rest of the Israelis who live in the West Bank? Yeah, so, I mean, the types of, I mean, Isa can probably answer this better than me because he comes into contact with them probably much more than I do. But, um, you know, there there's different types of, of settlers and settler violence. And, you know, the, the ones that we know about from when settler violence became more of an issue and was, was not even really called settler violence, it was called price tag attacks. Uh, this was happening like a decade ago. Um, when Israelis wanted to kind of uh, show Palestinians and the state that they uh, don't like a certain action. Like, for example, if Israel evacuates a settler outpost that even Israel considers illegal under Israeli law or tells a bunch of settlers to get out of a certain area, um, then those, those settlers and communities would try and do a price tag attack, which either burn cars, write graffiti, intimidate Palestinians, and then send a message. So um, there's there's those kinds of settlers, um, and a lot of them are very young, um, and what, what is known in Israel as hilltop youth. Um, but th that hilltop youth is also very radical, and so there's the kinds that will react to certain state actions, and then there's the kind that will literally go in the middle of the night onto a hilltop and claim it as their own, and then stake it out and stay there. Um, and so you have teenagers who are doing that, but you also have now a phenomenon of settler uh, farm outposts or herding outposts where you have, uh, you know, even just a single individual or a single family that starts uh, to gather uh, herding cattle, um, sheep or, what, or goats or whatever. And then they will basically um, take over an entire acres of land um, by calling it a farm. And these are, you know, middle aged people. These are not teenagers. Um, and this is part of uh, Smotrich's plan to expand. And these are certain settler groups that have money coming directly from the state um, in which they have found a really good effective tactic where they don't need the government to even necessarily allocate that land. They can just take land, say that it's for farming, 
but effectively take away the agricultural or farming land from the Palestinian. And they don't and, and they can take over large swaths of land without actually building any homes for settlers on it. They don't really need that much to do it. Um, so that's the, those are the kinds of uh, people that are uh, engaging directly in settler violence. And when I say settler violence, it's important to remember that, again, this is a spectrum. It can be anything from telling a Palestinian that he can't uh, herd his cattle in a certain area or blocking a road or blocking his access to water uh, to full on assaulting. So it's, it's a wide spectrum and it, it can be it's almost it's usually male, although there are females who engage in it as well. And it's usually young uh, from the age of teenagers to now what we see as more middle aged men who have families and start these farms. And Isa, maybe you can describe a little bit more the, the, this incident that you are uh, witnessing uh, in the West Bank. And also, I wanted to ask you if you have ever seen uh, the Israeli army confronting uh, uh, Israeli settlers and, and, and preventing them from attacking Palestinians, for instance. Isa, I'm not sure if you can uh, hear us. Maybe you're on mute. Yes, now. Do you hear yes. me now? Uh, if you read uh, Breaking the Silence uh, organization uh, testimonies, uh, Breaking the Silence is an ex-Israeli uh, soldier who talk about their experience in the military, and they are, it's a human rights organization. You, you, if you read their testimonies, you understand a lot. The relationship between the Israeli uh, settlers and the Israeli uh, soldiers and the Israeli uh, soldiers and the Israeli settlers, they are really even uh, now have much better, uh, stronger relationship and coordination and they really see themselves as one, one group. Uh, uh, in the past, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I saw once, twice, maybe uh, soldiers trying to stop to, to or to prevent settlers from uh, attacking uh, Palestinians, uh, or they confronted them when they were evacuating, uh, you know, some illegal settlements and outposts. But nowadays, I don't see any soldiers who are really uh, doing anything to stop settlers from uh, attacking, destroying. Uh, Pal Palestinians, you know, two months ago, a settler was, uh, you know, he came to my house and started uh, damaging my terrace. I called the soldier. The soldier was there. Uh, he died after intervening. I was telling the soldier, even in video, please, you know, stop him, arrest him. Nothing happened to that uh, settler. And for sure, he's not accountable, stealing my lemon tree, destroying my water tanks. This is me, but many other uh, Palestinians. So the Israeli military is is there. The soldiers tell me we are here only to protect the the settlers. This is what they think their mandate is. This is what their commanders told them that you are here only to protect uh, the the settlers, not to protect the Palestinians, not to make the settlers accountable. And something else very important to address. Palestinians in the occupied territories are under the Israeli military law. And the settlers are under the Israeli civilian law. So we have two sets of laws for different people. And mainly one of the main uh, reasons why the settlers are, uh, are, are very, very violent. I, I can say that many organizations, many diplomats, the State Department, even the foreign, uh, you know, uh, many foreign uh, diplomats, they started describing last year, describing settler violence as settler's terror. So they, 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 they use the reports uh, and describe what the settlers do as terror because it's now uh, organized uh, much more than before and uh, they, they really, they really, you know, uh, becoming more and more uh, terrorist in the ground and uh, the soldiers feel feel closer to them and the soldiers are the israeli you know young generation who are teenagers 19 20 21 and they are the ones who are really uh, affected by uh, itamar bingvir propaganda the israeli extremist uh, minister 
who is, you know, openly telling the Israeli police not to make the settlers accountable for their violence. And uh, uh, Smotrich, the same, Netanyahu, and many other Israeli leaders. So I can say that the Israeli settlers are now, they were ruling from, uh, 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 ruling all over West Bank, uh, because uh, now with Smotrich and the settlers are the ones who are, you know, responsible about the civil administration. The civil administration, it's the department uh, which is responsible about Palestinian affairs in the occupied territories. So they are now uh, responsible about our life details, what, import, export, work permits, uh, building, water, uh, electricity for Palestinians is controlled by by the settlers now. And uh, for example, in Hebron, they reduced the amount of wa water we get by 40%. This is what was the decision of uh, Smotrich, so not to give Hebron enough water. The same with uh, Area C. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about Hebron City, which is an A area. Uh, so they are controlling now all over West Bank, and the army listens to them. They do whatever they want uh, for them. Uh, so they have a huge power in the army. They had power. Now they have much more influence. In the other hand, they have much more influence, uh, you know, in the in Israel. I can say that settlers they are the main power in Israel now. This is what what I can say. Uh, w w one more question to you, Issa. But before, just a reminder: if you want to ask a question, please send a, send your question uh, uh, as a direct message to uh, uh, to the account of Crisis Group. Uh, in terms of the Palestinian response, whether it's by the Palestinian Authority. Uh, or others, how are Palestinians responding to this increase, to this increase of uh, of settler violence? Is is that fueling uh, militancy and and uh, and violence on the Palestinian side as well, for instance? Uh, you know, first of all, Palestinian authority is uh, uh, is without any authority. They are they they are really you know completely controlled by the Israeli military. And they just implement what the Israeli military tells them. Uh, Palestinians in, in general, uh, many of them left their homes from Area C. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about thousands of Palestinians left their homes in Area C. So uh, the plan of annexation, the annexation plan of Area C to Israel is going on on the ground. Uh, for example, H2, um, many Palestinian families left their homes because of Settler violence and army uh, violence and brutality. So they their their policies, their violence is working, and they will go on with their with their with their violence uh, toward the Palestinians. And the reaction of Palestinians sometimes it's uh, violence. It's the violent circle which uh, no one will be able to stop. This is what what's going on. But Palestinians are accountable for their violence. So if you if you try to defend your house from settler violence. The army will intervene, and they may shoot you too. You may, you may you might be killed from the army if you try to sto throw stones back to where the settlers were attacking your house, who are burning your car, who are burning your property. You are not allowed by the Israeli military to defend to defend yourself. So there is no way to defend yourself physically from uh, settlers. What we do usually uh, to react to their uh, violence, and this is what I train Palestinian families and Palestinian youth and Palestinian women to document these violence to use the cameras to document to video tape uh, the record the the violence uh, to talk to media to uh, talk to israeli human rights organizations to report it and uh, and i know that uh, many palestinians are now going to the icc to sue uh, settlers and go after them uh, legally Thank you, Isa. And, 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 and speaking of that, uh, Delaney, uh, are there, we, we talked about the sanctions and the fact that the U.S. Uh, uh, sanctions uh, some of uh, individuals, settlers individuals. Uh, are there other avenues for the U.S. or other powers to, to try to rein in this, uh, this violence in the West Bank? Yeah, I mean, uh, sanctions are not a silver bullet, and we can't expect them to bring down the settlement enterprise, let alone settler violence all by themselves, even if they're extended and they're expanded to major nodes of the settlement project like Amana or the settlement division of the World Zionist Organization. They're one tool of many that are needed for the U.S. to press Israel on its policies in the West Bank. Um, I, I think I think 
the U.S. could be doing much more. As a first step, the U.S. could be much more vocal about the responsibility that lies with the Israeli state for settler violence um, and the support that for settler violence that's coming from senior government officials. Um, it's been um, disappointing, the events of, of recent days, um, especially following the, the killing of the Turkish-American activist, to see so so little um, from the Biden administration, especially from the from the president, about um, what steps can be taken to um, to crack down on the violence that's sort of the natural the, the natural result of the settlement project. Um, and, and beyond that, as a, as a second step um, or an additional step, the U.S. already has policies in place that it could um, imp- implement um, to, uh, to, to make a difference. For one, it could enforce the Leahy laws. The Leahy laws prohibit U.S. assistance to a unit of a foreign armed force if the secretaries of state and defense have credible information that the unit has cr- committed a gross violation of human rights. Um, it could enforce these laws. Um, it could refrain from transferring arms um, if it believes that Israel is likely to use them to commit violations of the Fourth Geneva Convention um, or impose other di- other conditions for weapons weapons transfers. Um, and so just to, just to emphasize again that sanctions can't be the only step. There have to be other policies put in place by U.S. administrations to really make a difference on this issue and for the U.S. to use the leverage that it has over the Israeli government to stop this kind of activity. And Isa, what, what steps do you believe are necessary to address the, 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 the increase in incident of, of settler violence from the international community or from the external powers? As to increase awareness about settler uh, violence and to describe it as it is. And there are many settlers who are American citizens, for example, to make them accountable according to the American law. Uh, to to stop the funding to the settlers, uh, settler organizations, in, and that may, and make it illegal to collect funding to any project in the uh, for the settlers in the occupied uh, territories, and I think to 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 really have a, a, a kind of uh, real punishment to the Israeli leaders who are supporting uh, settlements and make them accountable uh, according to Geneva Convention Article 49 all the settlements are illegal and it's a war crime so we want the ICC to intervene and, and make it uh, make it uh, costly for them Amnesty International has an amazing campaign uh, it was launched I think 2016 <coughs> 17 it's called ban the settlement goods that we don't allow any product of uh, of the Israeli settlements uh, from uh, to be sold in the states or in in Europe. Not only to label the settlement goods, but make it illegal. It's Ill- illegal entities, you know, in the occupied uh, t- territories. And for sure, we encourage all everybody to divest from settlements. You know not to invest, not to spend any money. We know that there is there are many research uh, funded by the American government, funded by the European government, by European organizations, and all research are in the settlement. In this way, we can really make the settlement and the occupation costly and uh, force the Israeli leaders to accept the peace plan. Uh, Michael, uh, there is uh, an election coming in the U.S. I think everybody knows uh, about that. W- what are we to expect from the the, the, the two candidates, Kamala Harris and, and Donald Trump, uh, in regard to, to 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 this issue? Uh, w- w- first, would Kamala Harris have a very different uh, view and policy uh, from Joe Biden? Well, I mean, let's start with I think that. The easier bit of that is that uh, there are stark differences uh, between the two, the candidates themselves. Uh, if we look at the the track record of of the Trump administration, um, I mentioned earlier Pompeo's uh, reversal of uh, the traditional uh, U.S. position on on the, on settlements, um, and of course that implicated. Uh, the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights, uh, uh, which uh, the which Trump administration recognized, uh, the the moving of the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to uh, Jerusalem, um, and uh, uh, you know a, a general attitude of permissiveness 
uh, even more so uh, with respect to uh, the settlement enterprise. Um, you look at uh, the, the sort of personality of the, uh, the uh, American ambassador at the time, Ambassador Friedman, um, and uh, you know, you can draw a very stark contrast uh, with uh, even uh, the policies of the Biden administration. Um, of course, there has been in the context of the Gaza war, uh, a lot of focus since uh, the vice president um, became uh, the nominee um, on whether there would be uh, a sharp difference between her handling uh, of uh, Palestinian issues writ large uh, when when compared to the Biden administration. I think it is um, difficult for uh, a sitting vice president to to uh, you know break uh, with the administration uh, she serves. And so uh, she has sought to walk a line that I think frankly has not satisfied uh, critics of the administration, understandably. Um, but I do, I do think we can surmise that uh, just even from her time in, in the Biden administration and the limited steps that they have taken uh, with respect to settlements uh, to date, that this is still, uh, again, insufficient as they are, um, quite a big difference uh, with what a prospective Trump administration would seek to implement. Uh, you know, we can, I think, rest assured that uh, the sanctions policy is something that would be uh, unwound um, in a Trump administration. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think we, you know, we, we have a good sense of the differences between the, the, the potential uh, next administrations. And Michael, there was a question for you uh, from one of our listeners uh, about the, the, the Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel normalization. Uh, and the question is that what does this to, to do to balance the... What, this normalization, what could that do to balance to, to the balance of power in the region uh, in resp and response to by Iran or by the Palestinians? Well, I mean, I, I think first off, uh, you know, I don't think there's going to be normalization. Um, you know, I think uh, there are members of the Biden administration who believe that uh, if it wasn't for October 7th, that there would have been uh, a deal, that most of that had been worked out. Uh, I'm, I'm more doubtful. Uh, but from where we stand today, um, it's very difficult to imagine such a deal materializing. There are uh, some... Uh, conditions with respect to Palestinian issues, um, you know, even if they are somewhat uh, far-fetched and uh, amorphous. Um, we've seen language about uh, uh, a framework uh, to strive toward a Palestinian state, pretty vague uh, language, uh, very much unenforceable. But even that very low bar is something that this Israeli government can't clear. Uh, they are adamantly opposed to such things um, and have said so repeatedly. Um, and prior to October 7th, uh, I think uh, from the statements of, of the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, there was a sense that normalization could happen with very little given on the Palestinian front, if at all. Um, and, and, and that's not really an option at this point. Uh, you know, even that window dressing um, is, is, is too much. Uh, and despite what that might mean in strategic terms, it would obviously be a huge boon. The idea of uh, becoming a normal country in the region is something that Israelis have aspired to uh, for decades. Um, and uh, I think they thought, uh, many thought, in Israel, in the United States, that the pathway for that kind of normalization was established by what happened with uh, uh, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain uh, and Morocco, um, and that uh, you know this this was going to be the kind of framework that uh, through which uh, Israel uh, interacted with the region uh, going forward. Um, and you know, I think uh, over the course of the almost past year, um, I think you know, we, we should be disabused with those notions because uh, it, it doesn't look like that that can be a, a framework that can, can be revitalized at the moment. Thank you, Michael. And if you want to ask a question to uh, Issa, Delaney, Meirav, or, 
oh, Michael, now is the time. Uh, Merav, there is a question, and I know you're not going to like it, uh, because it's about the peace process. <laughs> and I don't know what's left of the peace process, but there is a question about the peace plan that was initiated by uh, Gershon Baskin, Ehud Olmert, uh, uh, and the Palestinian minister. I mean, I guess the question is, is there any room at the moment for a peace plan or a peace process? And I'm sorry for asking this question. <laughs> Um, I mean, on, I, I, on the one hand, you know, October 7th and everything that we've seen since is, um, you know, proof and evidence and reason and urgency for why, you know, nothing can can be normal and nothing can, can improve in the Middle East uh, without dealing with the Palestine-Israel issue and with um, what Israel has been doing to the Palestinians um, for a long time and in much more intensity uh, since October 7th in, in ways that we, you know, in terms of the destruction that we haven't seen since World War II. Um, and also in many ways, Israel as a state that came into existence as a result of the Holocaust and what happened in World War II, actually being the one to kind of upend and undermine the same international laws and understandings is what is so tragic here. But I mean, so, you know, after October 7th, some people were like, okay, look, uh, Hamas was strategically smart in, br you know, bringing back the Palestinian issue. And now we have a real chance to do that. But if you ask any Israeli, uh, an average Israeli or an Israeli official, they'll tell you that there is the least uh, appetite or ability or willingness to enter any kind of negotiations to even think about concessions to think about a Palestinian state or a two-state solution. So on a realistic level, it, it doesn't it doesn't look promising. That doesn't mean that people shouldn't be trying. But I think what this, you know, call this this Twitter space has shown that like the first step is is to stop the harm. Um, to stop the harm that has been happening uh, in the West Bank and in Gaza. I mean obviously this is not about Gaza, but we can't ignore Gaza. And um, and, and this really is in many ways, I mean, none of this is new. And in many ways, this is on the U.S., which has the leverage and the power, um, the diplomatic, economic and military power um, to change Israeli policies. And for various reasons, it hasn't. Um, and so in many ways, this lies with the U.S. Um, and with other international players uh, that have not, you know, have not done what, what is needed. So and, and in many ways, all of the the ceasefire and hostage talks um, that are stuck and that have mostly become a, a bit of a, a facade and a sham are very similar in that sense to the uh, U.S. mediation of the two-state solution for decades uh, that ended up going nowhere. And at the heart of all of this is the fact that Israel is occupying land that is supposed to be part of a Palestinian state. Um, and that issue isn't going away. And the changes that we're seeing now um, on the ground uh, in the West Bank and in Gaza uh, are a direct result of years and years and years of Israelis, Israeli governments being able to advance, um, you know, these, these, these uh, actions with impunity. Um, and I would argue that it's not only not in the interests of the Palestinians or of uh, the world order, but it's not in the interests of Israelis and their security either, because we saw what happened uh, and how the military, with all its surveillance and technology and power and dominance, wasn't wasn't prepared on October 7th and hasn't been able to get out of the quagmire since then. So it's clear that we need um, change and we need uh, accountability and we need international uh, interference, um, but we need it to be genuine and we need it to be serious um, and, and not what we've seen until now. Issa, uh, maybe a, a question for you, but in light of everything that is, is happening in the West Bank and in, in Gaza and, uh, and, and in Israel, I mean, do, do you still believe in a Palestinian state, in the possibility of the Palestinian state? Uh, and do Palestinians in the West Bank believe in this possibility still? Usually after war, uh, peace uh, comes. So I'm, I'm always optimistic that one, one day the occupation uh, uh, will end and uh, the occupiers and uh, settlers will be uh, accountable. I see that more people in the world now are really aware and they know the truth and they know what's going on in the occupied uh, uh, territories. I hope that this public support to the 
Palestinian cause to, to be transformed to political support, uh, we can't make peace without a real intervention from the international community. Uh, and uh, we, we see more and more people now supporting Palestinian rights, uh, and many, many people support the end of the occupation, and they say there is no normal, normalization and there is no normal relationship with Israel without ending the occupation. I think I will see more uh, divestment uh, to the, the settlements, more uh, sanctions to the settlements, and the settlements will be really the target in the future of even many officials, uh, especially after the SAJ uh, ruling. And uh, we need Palestinians, what, what they should do. We, the Palestinians, should reunite ourselves, reform the PLO, reform the PA, uh, fight the corruption in, in the PA. This is our responsibility as well, that we, 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 we have uh, uh, stronger and uh, more transparency, stronger institutions and more transparency in our leadership. Uh, and we have to have a democracy. This will be, uh, I hope, soon. It's not practical now to talk about it. It's now the time to talk about, uh, to end the war, to stop the settler violence. Uh, uh, and uh, what I I, th I tell uh, officials when I meet them, without concrete plans and concrete actions to make the occupation and the apartheid costly, nothing will change. And this is what we should all work on. And this... Uh, what we do now is to increase awareness, to make the occupation and to make the illegal settlements costly and uh, to reach the point that we, 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 we end the occupation and we have a Palestinian uh, state and see Palestinians see freedom and justice and equality. Uh, thank you, Isan. Maybe to conclude this uh, this Twitter space, uh, Merav or Delaney, the, the, the report, uh, the, the, the crisis group report, uh, uh, give some recommendation uh, at the end to try to uh, improve the situation on the ground uh, in the West Bank. Maybe Merav uh, or Delaney, do you want to uh, uh, to dive a little more into those uh, recommendations and, and what could be done? I mean, I, I can uh, I can jump in here and. Uh that part of the report is quite short, so people can read it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, we talk about the what, what has been done until now and what could be done. And on the sanctions issue, which we've covered here, uh, there is a lot more that can be done. Um, and I think we're only at the beginning of it. And obviously the elections in the US are, are complicating the situation. Um, but, uh, you know, we've had uh, over half a century of settlements and settler violence and only a few months of sanctions. So I think it's worth seeing where it goes. Um, and we have uh, other elements happening. I mean, the EU has its own policies um, that it hasn't implemented on differentiation, what Issa talked about, about labeling settler products, settlement products. Um, and there's also uh, a flurry of calls in the U.S. and uh, certain European states have started taking actions uh, to limit export licenses on arms. Um, and certain arms embargoes, uh, which we do also call for in the report, um, specifically regarding settler violence. And that's something that, again, has been known and discussed forever, but hasn't been uh, implemented. And I think now there's um, more um, groundswell for that to happen. But of course, it depends who does it on, on what level, because there's only a few countries, the US, Germany, for example, where it would actually be effective in places like Canada or the UK, where it's more, more symbolic. Um, uh, and there's a bunch of other steps that can be taken, but I think ultimately, um, you know, the, the bigger picture here is not just the steps that can be taken, but the, the, the real political will um, to, to take uh, certain positions um, that have economic and diplomatic consequences for these countries. And, you know, as we've seen until today, there's very little incentive to do that for these countries because they have trade relations with Israel because Israel is a kind of, you know, a Western power in the Middle East. Um, so it, it's very hard to see those things happening, uh, but that doesn't mean that they that they shouldn't be happening. And, and as we see, the situation on the ground is a real destabilizing uh, um, situation that, you know, could lead to all out regional war, could lead to major economic shifts uh, and problems when you think about Houthis in the Red Sea. So there are incentives that I think, unfortunately, with all the death and destruction are becoming more clear. But ultimately, you know, no matter how many recommendations we make, there has to be uh, the political will to go there. 
Thank you very much, Mirab. I really encourage uh, our listeners to go and see and read your report uh, for themselves on the Croisset Group website. Uh, the, the recording of this conversation will be available on Croisset Group website uh, as well. Uh, Merav, Issa, Delaney, Michael, thank you very much for the conversation. And again, I also encourage you to go and check uh, Issa's work, uh, either on his Twitter account uh, or, or, or on the internet. Uh, thank you. And that was it for this uh, Twitter space. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We are back.